Welcome and thank you for attending Equity is More Than a Word, the fourth and final event in our four part series entitled Structural Racism in the Arts. As we gather during a month that we celebrate thankfulness and gratitude, I would like to recognize that November is also Native American Heritage Month. It is a time to celebrate the traditions, languages, and stories of Native American, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, and island communities to ensure their rich histories and contributions continue to thrive with each passing generation. My name is Vanya Bynum and I work at East Hub on community engagement and outreach. I use she, her pronouns. I am African-American with brown skin. I am wearing a black shirt, large brown earrings, and I have a big smile. Our goal at East Hub is to make our uniquely diverse East Side a more welcoming and vibrant community with a thriving arts and culture core. I'm very excited to be a part of this effort to fully uplift all of the cultures that are represented here in our communities. The groundbreaking work that we do at East Hub is relevant to the continued growth and development of the East Side and beyond. The racism in the art series is an important step in the healing that must occur with full equity. I would like to start by reading our land acknowledgement. East Hub acknowledges that we live and work on the unceded traditional land of the Coast Salish peoples. That includes, but is not limited to, Snoqualmie, Suquamish, Duwamish, Nisqually, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot tribes. We appreciate and honor the original residents of this land and stand in solidarity with them against longstanding inequities and systemic oppression. We are committed to building enduring relationships and striving together to achieve just, equitable, and impactful change. We know that this kind of acknowledgement is not a new practice, but it is a traditional custom dating back centuries for many native communities and nations. It is a powerful way of showing respect and honor the indigenous peoples of the land on which we work and live. Acknowledgement is a simple way of resisting the erasure of indigenous histories and working towards honoring and inviting the truth. Now my colleague, Sadishna Dixit, the Director of Cultural Connections will give us a brief intro about what we do here at East Hub. Sorry, I forgot to mute myself. Thank you, Venya, and welcome everyone. I'm really glad that you could make it here today. Uh, my name is Sudesh Nag. I use she, her pronoun. I am South Asian. I have shoulder length dark hair and hazel eyes, and I'm wearing a beige shirt and jeans. Um, and I'm also wearing a smile. Um, at East Hub, our mission is to create a shared future for arts and culture on the East Side. Um, and we do this by engaging and working with our diverse East Side community. And what we mean by shared future is that uh, we're working towards building shared spaces for arts and cultural performances and gathering. We're developing shared services to help organizations work more efficiently and creating shared resources that build connections. And we are always, always working towards being truly responsive and uh, an anti-racist organization. Um, I'm going to keep it very brief, uh, but if you would like to know more about us, please, please do send me an email and I, I would love to chat with you. Um, so thank you all for coming today. This is going to be an interactive workshop. Please participate. Please make new friends and we will collectively come up with lots of insights and lots of actions. Back to you, Benya. Okay. So um, first I'd like to share a little bit about the history of our series. Structural Racism in the Arts is a series of equity, diversity, and inclusion workshops. The main purpose of the series is to understand structural racism, discuss its effects on the arts community, and consider ways to create change in our systems. We started with foundations for building a race equity plan, Next, we had a lens on racist policies in the arts community. Our third event was Merging Our Worlds, New Best Practices, where we had people come and share from their organizations 
what things they were doing to promote equity. And today we have equity is more than a word. Understanding that the history of racism and systemic oppression of not only African-Americans, but of other races as well, has been a consistent part of our history here in America. Through this series, we hope that we have contributed to a progressive space in history that changes the narrative and turns the tide toward equity. So let us begin with a quick poll. So the first question was, how many significant relationships do you have with people of color? And these are things that you can think about since you can't do the poll. So one to five, five to 15, 15 plus. How many significant relationships do you have with people of color? Number two, in the past year, how many arts events did you attend that prominently featured artists of color? None, one to three, four plus. Number three, if none, if you chose none, why is that the case? Did you not hear about them? Or are you someone who doesn't really think of race when you plan what you're gonna do? You just see something and you want to do. Um, and then were those events not accessible to you? Okay, I think most people might have filled in the poll. I cannot see it, but if that's the case, then Kat, maybe you can just shut it down. We're at roughly 46% participated. Oh, awesome. I was able to submit. Okay, now let me introduce our speaker before we move forward. Michael J. Bobbitt is the Executive Director of the Massachusetts Cultural Council, an arts leader, and the EDI consultant here at East Hub. Michael's guidelines and recommendations for reimagining anti-racist culture in the arts have been adopted by several organizations throughout the US. In addition to dedicating his life to arts leadership, Michael is also a director, a choreographer, a playwright, and a performing artist. You have the floor, Michael. Hello, everyone. It's really great to be back in the room with some of you and to see new faces and names that I haven't met before. Um, thrilled to be supporting East Hub in this work. Uh, I think it's very important work, and I think you have a great opportunity out on the East Side because of the diversity of the community and the rich arts scene to really make a huge impact that could actually be a template for the rest of the country. Uh, I did find it interesting, um, the poll results, and I think it's something you should reflect on. I also think those are the kinds of questions we want to ask um, people when we're thinking about hiring um, in our arts organizations. You know, if people haven't engaged, if you're trying to be an anti-racist organization and people haven't engaged in art that is by a multicultural community, they may not be the right fit for your organization if you're anti-racist. It's a good question to ask your board members too when you're interviewing them. What are their relationships like with people of color? What kind of art have they engaged in in the last year? Uh, I think if you are committed to being an anti-racist organization, coming onto an organization and you haven't opened up the book on anti-racism may not be the best, the best fit for an organization. Um, I'm excited to be here today with you. Uh, we're going to briefly go over somewhat what we worked on in the last um, three sessions. And I'm going to kind of whip through this a little fast, um, just so we can get to some, some group exercises. Uh, just fix a couple of things. Can you all see? Yes. All right. So we started with some group agreements, which was the start of our learning. So I'm going to go over those really quickly. Uh, Anti-racism is an act of love. We are trying to show love to people that have never been loved by this country before. And I always hope that motivates people to see that this is not an act of compliance. This is an act of love. Anti-racism, equity, diversity, inclusion, anti-oppression, oppression, all of that. 
want to choose love over anxiety. We're trying to show love to people. So sometimes our fears about what's happening may, may pop up more than the love that we want to do. When we're into these spaces, we're going to be brave in these spaces. It's a little bit better than a safe space. Safe space or something that we cannot guarantee because something may not feel safe for someone. But a brave space means that you're pushing past fears. And if you say something that may be um, harmful, you will um, be brave enough and accept re um, feedback on that. Learning starts where knowledge ends. Lived experience trumps intellect. Uh, we want to listen to and believe people of color when they tell us what they are feeling. Embrace discomfort. None of us have the right to, um, to, to comfort in conversations around race, partly because we all have kind of like been terrible at this thing because this thing still exists. So to, to, to assume that you have, you're going to be comfortable in these conversations may be a myth. Um, opposition is data. I want us to think about differing opinions being data, being information, being an asset to help us make the most inclusive and equitable decisions. Listening opens hearts and minds. And then one of the things I really push for people is to leave every single conversation or learning that you have about race equity with one action and idea, just one would move us all forward. We also had a brief talk about what is racism. Racism is the belief and the idea that one race is superior and therefore deserves more and has the right to dominate other races. And more importantly, it is a system, a structure, and an institution that favors members of one race while discriminating against or harming members of other races, ultimately serving to preserve the social status, economic advantage, and political power of the dominant race. It is a system and a structure. So that when we embrace that idea, we, we separate the act or the person from the system and the structure. And if it's a system and structure, then we can do things about that. There are three components to racism. I'm gonna go through this really, really fast. I wanna get through the, the interactive stuff later on. Three components of racism, prejudice, social power, and legal authority. Prejudice, social power, and legal authority. In this country, there's only one group of people that has the prejudice and the social power and the legal authority to create systems and structures to dominate another race. And with this definition, it really means that people of color can't be considered racist because they don't have the social power and the legal authority. Um, they can be derogatory, they can be bigots, they can say terrible things, but they cannot be considered racist. Our alternate is anti-racism. And that means that there's no such thing as not racist. There's no way you can be a, a, a non-BIPOC person or a white person in this country and be not racist. There's no way you cannot benefit from the systems and the structures. So the only option is to be anti-racist, which means that you are doing something. So anti-racism refers to a form of action against racial hatred, bias, systemic racism, and the oppression of specific groups. It's usually structured around conscious efforts and deliberate actions to provide equal opportunities. And I always tell people, those who made the rules have the power, the social power and the legal authority that we talked about to change the rules. And so ending racism requires confession, which is to acknowledge that I benefit from the systems and the structure. And then to educate yourself so you know what the, the systems and the structures are, what they look like. And then you have to decenter and make changes and dismantle. So we talked a lot about that. And then we talked about why build a racial equity plan. What are the benefits of having an actual plan, a document, and not just a belief statement? It's the right thing to do. Um, there's public outrage about it. There's executive orders from the US president. And it's time. Sam Cook just sang to us. It's a long time coming. It's a series of love actions that demonstrate confession, decentering, and education while rebuilding trust for BIPOC. So this document is going to help you with your recruiting efforts for board members, for donors, for new patrons. 
um, this this document that says, "Hey, we're doing we're taking these actions to become anti-racist," and it helps moves us toward ending this race war. Many people think we're starting it, but talking about racism does not benefit people of color. We just want this thing to be over. It also centers the most marginalized, and then everyone will benefit when we are when oppression exists. No one is free. It takes actions towards correcting a 400 or really a 650 year head start when we think about the uh, colonization. And it's really, really good for business. Those of you that are in the arts, one of the things that makes me a person of color is that art and culture is inherent in who I am. If you ask me what makes me a black man, I will say it's the music and the dance and the words and the language and the fashion, that's all art. So there's a there's a great group of people out there that that are great potential patrons for your organization. But if you haven't redesigned your business model so that you can include them in the design of the business model and in the programming, you're missing out on a large, large, large group of people that really could be good for your business. I'm going to take a bit of a pause there to see if there are any questions. All right. When you're building this document, this plan that I would advise you to publicly share after you build it, you're going to have a bunch of obstacles. So some of those are the fear of loss. People are not necessarily afraid of change. They're afraid of loss. And many people will go through the seven stages of grief, even if it's something small. If, it, if, it, if it's a loss of some power or some privilege, they may not go for it. Sometimes we get stuck in education. We go to courses and workshops and, and, and panels and we read books and then yet we don't move towards action. Your plan is your action plan. Sometimes we choose anxiety over love. We get nervous about what this means for our organization or who's gonna be upset by this change. And so we focus on the people that are upset versus the people that we are trying to show love to. The fear of pioneering, we often wait till someone else tries it first and really to fight racism, which is a creative tool to keep people oppressed. We need creative people to come up with new ideas and try them first. Predominantly white institutions and homogeneity, I tell organizations that are predominantly white that it was designed to be that way. Not to say that it was done out of some malice, but the business model was designed by white people and it will benefit white people. And so it shouldn't be a surprise. And the only way to become truly inclusive is to redesign the business model with people of color. You cannot do racial equity without people of color. It won't happen. Monolithic plans, I often suggest that people focus on a racial equity plan first, do it first. It's the hardest thing that we have to deal with. Do that first, and then you'll have a template to build your other plans, your gender equity plans, your um, disability and deaf plan, your rural equity plan, whatever, whatever groups of people you want to engage with, separate those into a suite of plans, but try to stick it all together in an EDIAJ plan because it's gonna to be too big and you actually won't really get much done. A lot of people step into the room uninformed, and so they'll push back on things they don't understand. Um, sometimes we focus on policies and programs rather than culture shifts. One of the best thing, one of the first things that arts organizations do is to offer discount tickets as if the discount ticket will fix your racial issues. The discount ticket is great to benefit people that can't afford to pay full price tickets, but that's not gonna fix the racism issue that you may have in your organization. If people of color aren't coming to your organization, it's not because of the ticket price. Because when Beyonce come into town, I'm spending $300. Um, toxic intellectualism. Progressive liberals with conditions, these are, I often call them good white people and not racists. They can't see themselves benefiting from the systems and structures, or they will say, I'm a good person. 
I'm not racist. I like people of color, but they still benefit from the same thing that people of, that people who don't like people of color benefit from. In this country, because it's a system and structure, all white people benefit from the system and the structure. So there's no such thing as not racist. The only, the only option you have is anti-racist. And then allyship. Sometimes people will align themselves with um, with uh, uh, people who are really fighting this, and they just they just align themselves, but they actually aren't doing any actions. So those are some of the obstacles to building a racial equity plan. Then as we, we sort of walk through um, a basic process for how to put together a plan, and I put this out in some action steps. So the first thing is you want to like state all the specific problems. You can do this together with a group of people. You can populate a spreadsheet. You can get in a room and write them up on big old sticky notes, but state all the problems. We, our board is not diverse. Our staff is not diverse. Our HR policies are prohibiting us from getting candidates that are diverse. We don't have enough diversity in our program. The artists we hire are all the same, mostly the same race. Um, the, whatever the problems are, you can go on and on and on, but state the problems first so you all are very clear and try to make sure we're all on the same page about that, those problems. Then start taking each problem and creatively ideate actions that will dismantle or eradicate the problem stated. So if people of color aren't applying to our jobs, then the ideas are, let's really revise our job descriptions from a racial equity aspect so we can get rid of all the things that might other them. So that may look like, let's get rid of years of service because some people don't get a chance to get a job so they don't have years of service, but they're still really capable of the job. Let's get rid of, um, uh, um, degrees, higher education degrees, because a lot of people couldn't get into college. It doesn't mean they don't have the skills. So once you state the problem and you start thinking about the ideas that you can change to, to dismantle and eradicate those problems, you want to start listing those on the board. And then we want to clearly define our goals. And we use a tool called, I like to use a tool called SMART Outcome Goals. Um, SMART stands for specific, measurable, um, attainable, I actually like to replace the A with aggressive, relevant and time-based. And we're actually gonna do some of this in, in a little bit later. But we take our action steps and then we define what our outcome goals are. So how do we make it super specific? How do we add a measurable to it? How do we add a time to it? Uh, we wanna make sure each of our action steps centers the needs of BIPOC people. And I'll show you how to do that a little bit later. I want to make sure each action attempts to change the culture so that we're not just layering on a policy or a program. We're actually going, why are we doing this? Why are we taking this action step? What is the intended cultural shift that we want to have? And then lastly, we want to build our, um, formulate all those actions that we've done into a framework. And I'll show you that framework. Any questions? All right, so here, just a chart for SMART outcome goals, uh, and I, we'll, we'll take you through that. Um, there's many documents online about SMART outcome goals. It's actually been, um, it's morphed a little bit to SMART-T, that adds an I and an E, which adds inclusive and equitable. When you're building a racial equity plan, the I and the E is a little redundant, but when you're thinking about other things in your organizations, the I and the E on SMART is a good tool. Here's a tool for the framework. So. If you've gone through the steps, you have a list of action steps. And so this tool says, let's put them in, this is help us with our time base. Let's put them in an internal actions and external actions. What are we doing immediately? What are we doing longer term? And then I like to break it out to help you figure out how to organize into governance and board. What are the actions the governance and the board, the board are gonna take? Operations. So what are we doing in HR, finance, fundraising, um, whatever you have in your operations? What are we doing in programming? How are we changing our program to be more racially equitable? And then how are we also engaging with our audiences and changing our audiences and training our audiences how to become anti-racist? 
we'll, we'll look at this, we'll come back to this at the end. We also, in our second um, um, program, we brought in, um, we talked a little bit about some specific areas where we can actually start making anti-racist practices. So you're seeing this first column, here's the current practice, here are the kinds of things that we do in our HR hiring. Um, for example, we post the anti-racist statement at the end of our document. Um, and so, it, 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 you know, people of color, if you're a white presenting organization, people of color may not see it. They may not choose to read to the end of your document because you may be a white organization. Um, and so we, the result is that sometimes we just don't get a lot of people of color um, um, applying. It doesn't feel safe and welcome. It doesn't feel like a place for you. And so the equitable action is to start with your anti-racist statement, put it before your, put it before your mission and vision. Let it be the first thing people see, so they know you're serious about it. Um, not posting salary and benefits. It belittles the reality of BIPOC hardships, and they waste their time. They can apply to these jobs they may want, and then the salary is nowhere near what they might need. So post those. We're also going to share this PowerPoint with you, also you have it. But here are some things you can think about. Uh, and this is, again, stating the problem. The first column is how we state the problem. Then we can understand what the problem is in the middle column. And then the third, third column is the actions we may take to eradicate or dismantle those problems. We talked about in subscriptions. Uh, those who have the cash to buy a year's worth of tickets in advance receive priority and the best benefits. It's a very racist practice. Uh, if we think about people who have the cash flow to do that, it's probably mostly wealthy white people. And so poor, young, and brown and black people are left with the leftover seats. Um, so the equitable action is to eliminate subscriptions, replace with a more equitable patron loyalty program, or go to general admission seating. Uh, there are many patron loyalty programs that, that don't exist in the arts world that might be better models. Look at what they do in hotels or or um, restaurants or airlines or chambers of commerce. They may be better models than our current program. We talked about funding, um, what happens in the funding world. So again, you can see in this first column, some of the current practices, what the racist outcomes are of those practices, and then how we can eliminate them with equitable actions. Um, again, we'll share these so you have some of these with you. Um, and then we talked about governance. We brought in some guests that talked about what they're doing at their organization. So um, there were some discussions about what happens on the board level. Um, there was a thought of removing 100% board giving. Some people are actually now starting to separate fundraising and finance from, from the board's responsibilities altogether because a lot of power happens there. And the law actually doesn't say that the board has to fundraise, nor does it say the board has to approve the budget. Um, and so some thinking about where racism may sit in a governance space would be worth it. Um, they also, the, the guests came in and listed some of their challenges as well. We talked a little bit about one organization that's practicing distributed leadership, that's helping them become a more equitable organization. They've used a flat organization structure. They've distributed decision-making power. And they've actually started normalizing feedback. We also had a grant maker come and talk about some of the things they're doing to um, build an anti-racist grant-making world. And we learned a little bit about some of the participatory grant-making that's happening to help those grant makers figure out how to better serve BIPOC organizations. I'm gonna leave this up for a second because we're gonna do a little bit of um, um, group exercise. So if anyone wants to capture this and reach out to me for more specific details. Again, we'll share the slideshow with you. I know I breezed through that super fast. Uh, while we're waiting before we get to our next thing, are there any questions on anything that people saw? Nope. All right. Oh, are there things in the chat? 
All right, so um, we're going to do some interactive stuff. So you can take that quick, like, fast uh, work session, um, and then I can share with you a little bit. So one of the things we want to do first, too, and I actually should have done this in the beginning, but we want to um, find out for people that came to the previous uh, workshops, what, what were the, some of the big takeaways um, you had? So I'm going to put a link in the chat. If you've not used Jamboard before, um, you have to open up, click on the link in the chat and open it up. And then you'll see that there are some options for um, interacting with this, with this chat. So I'm just posting the Jamboard in now. Uh, I will also share it so everyone can see it. Um, so if you've come to um, workshops before, um, please just populate the Jamboard with anything that you that stuck with you, that you heard, or even anything you just heard in the last, you know, 20 minutes. What are some of the key takeaways? Some things that are like, oh, I hadn't really thought of that. Feel free East Help staff to also populate if you'd like. Ah, you pitched the Netflix model today. Anyone that wants to pop, whoever wrote that, feel free to pop on and tell us about that a little bit. I have my camera closed, sorry. Hi, I'm Will Moser with Pacific Northwest Ballet. Um, I actually, I don't know how I wound up on the uh, email list, but I barely found out about the uh, meetings earlier this week and signed up for everything and watched the previous three uh, throughout the week. Um, so yeah, I actually, we were having a development meeting today at the ballet and uh, when we were talking about sort of the financial situation for the coming year, I was like, hey, I just watched this great talk and dropped a YouTube link with a timestamp to the uh, second video where you were going specifically into uh, sort of the like racial undertones of like the subscription model. And they were open to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they wanted more information. Um, but yeah, like it was at least getting it out there. Better than okay. this. Yeah, well, feel free to reach out to me and I can tell you a little bit more about some of the research that we put into it and a little bit about what the um, what the um, performer looked like. Because it actually, we would have, I mean, I left the theater before uh, to a new job, but we would have actually made quite a bit more with that model than we did with the subscription model. Awesome. Seems like people are getting used to using it. So you can click on a bunch of icons on the side over here. The sticky note is a good one or the text box and type something in it. Um, anyone else want to share anything they found to be a uh, big takeaway? The 100% board giving, want to talk about that? So this is happening quite a bit. Um, in fact, I just led a whole workshop um, uh, in New York last weekend with uh, theaters from all over the country. Um, you know, a lot of us don't know really what's in the nonprofit uh, 501c3 statute, but really a lot of the rules that boards are governed by aren't necessarily law. They're just part of the culture and they've been considered best practices. And I, I don't really like that word best practice because it assumes that there was some scientific beta testing of numerous practices. And after um, disproving a bunch of practices, this thing emerged as the best practice, but that's probably not what happened. Um, but there, I think that governance and finance and fundraising are separate skills and separate needs and require separation from uh, uh, they require different kinds of things. So I think they should be separate. All right, um, I'll, I'm gonna 
stop sharing. No, I'm not going to stop sharing. I'll keep talking. Um, what am I doing? I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Okay, you can keep populating that board and we'll come back to it in a second. Um, if there's anything in the chat, please, um, Sudeshana and Banya, let me know. Um, okay, so I think we're at another poll. Is that right? Kat, you'll have to help me out, please. <laughs> Do you want me to read? I can leave it launch. Did it, did it launch? Yep, see it. Yes, you see it. So where's your organization in the process of taking equitable actions? We haven't done anything. We just started. We have processes in place that promote equity. Where are you? Some people call it awake to woke to work. Are you awake? Are you woke? Are you work? Uh, Will says, do I or answer where my organization says or where I think we are? I think you should do it personally. And then the second question is, what are the barriers to taking equitable action in your organization? Is there not much buy-in from the staff and the leadership? We don't know where to start. We need more training. We don't want to. All of those are real things I hear about almost every day. All right, anyone want to share anything about their poll answers? It's okay. We'll sort of share. Will, do you want to talk some more? <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to take up too much space, but yeah, like uh, our, our leadership would definitely say we're doing a great job and we're not doing nothing but there's work to be done that people are less comfortable with admitting than I would like. Yeah. I think uh, organizations have to recognize that one, it's, a, it's 400 years of stuff. So we're not gonna fix it right away. Um, I would also challenge leadership to think about um, like, it, like there's a way, so you can grade yourself. You can, from an A to an F, you can be like, I give myself a B. The problem with that is that once you get to an A, then you may stop working. And I think racial equity is more like leveling on a video game. There's always a way to level up to the next level and then the next level and then the next level. So we can always go deeper. Jay, I saw you come off uh, mute. Did you want yeah, to say something? I'm with the Bellevue Arts Museum. We are doing a lot of uh, things, actually. Uh, in the Great. DEI prompt. And uh, I mean, a lot of change. I'm actually impressed with the change that quickly happened. A lot of things are happening. So I'm very enlightened. You know, I just want you guys to know. So. That's great. Yeah, one of the things that happens is you'll, you'll once you start getting into this work and seeing that if you build these clear action steps and put measurables and timelines on them, when you start succeeding, people get more motivated, and then you'll see an evolution in conversations, and you'll start eradicating, and you'll start recognizing actions that need to be taken, and start eradicating them fast and faster and faster. Yeah, like you said, it's not easy, right? It's a 400 years of stuff, you know. A change is not going to come overnight. Uh, but mm -hmm. is it better than a year ago? You know, it's better than a six months ago. And says, yes, yes, you know. Agreed. Agreed. All right, so I'm going to go back to the Jamboard. Uh, I'll put the link in again in case you need to grab it again. Um, I'm going to look at the next four slides. And we're going to start helping each other out by populating the jam boards with action steps that you think should be taken or that you have taken 
Um, we put them into four separate, um, I'll show you, let me reshare uh, my screen. We have um, four slides. Uh, so you'll see here, uh oh. Oh, I put this in the wrong order. Sorry. Um, so we have four slides. So remember back when we showed you that chart that had four bullets governance, operations, programming, and audience. These are the four areas of your organization, your four constituent bases. Um, so what we want to do is you can shift between slides if you've opened the link. Um, what we want to do is populate this with some actions that we might want to take. Uh, and so toggle through each of these. Well, you might be great to stay on slide two and just think about what actions you can take in the fundraising world. Uh, I'm going to support this by putting a bunch of things on to give you some um, some ideas. But go ahead. So if, you, if you're not clear about um, actions, how to turn something into an action, just go ahead and populate it with stating the problem. When we talked about the problems earlier, problems can be not enough people of color on the board, not enough people of color on staff. Our HR is not yielding the results we want to have when we're um, getting applicants. Um, not enough patrons of color in our audiences. Uh, so go ahead and start populating this with some ideas and I will do the same. We're going to share this with each other, so we'd love for you all to just go ahead and start putting some ideas in there. You don't make me do this all by myself. Thank you. Nice, good, good ideas. Let's take a couple more minutes so we can talk about a few of these. All right.
keep populating because we want to share some of these with everyone. Let's take a minute to talk about governance. Uh, we have a few ideas. One is diversify the board. Um, the other is make sure anti-racism is embedded in all the decisions that the board are making. Give the EDI committee veto power. Make sure the exec committee has veto power. This stirring on any ideas for people? Anyone want to talk about some of these? This is Sudesh. I think this is more about establishing the culture of the organization from the very top level. And it's really important for the board and the staff to be on board. Um, just their, with their vision of being an anti-racist organization. So everything that the board decides um, and how they welcome staff and programming that they support, I think it plays a very important part in establishing the right culture. Yeah. Anything else anyone want to add? I'm just typing more things. I would say uh, there needs to be accountability steps for the board because like just simply having a training isn't enough. Like every, anybody can sit through a day long session and then sign a form at the end. And that doesn't really have any impact on the other end of it. So that could look like, so add accountability for the board. So that could look like um, add advanced racial equity to board agreement and evaluation. In the year, you ask the board member, what did you do to advance racial equity? And they've done nothing, then their, their job or their seat on the board may be in jeopardy. All right, how about in this world of HR, finance, marketing? Anything you want to talk about? I added eradicate tiered benefit levels. All donors get the same benefit. Will, take this back to Pacific Northwest. So uh, um, if I can only afford to give $25 because of the way the world is, but someone else can get $25,000 because of the way the world is, why do we tier those benefits? Why not say every donor gets the same benefits and have one level of benefits? That is an excellent question that, uh, so I posted in the fundraising section about our gala and I had the same comments where we're gonna tout our equity work and then host a $100,000 party for people that donate over $10,000 or not even donate, they buy a table for $10,000. And then we sit them down with dancers and musicians and stuff like that. And I was like, how are we, how are we at like doing this with a straight face? Then on the other hand, we turn around and that's the most money we've made in the last like five years. And yeah, yeah, but I wonder if there's a more equitable fundraising. Oh model. no, I absolutely agree. Where it's it's not yeah. a cool thing. It's just you have to have I have to have something in my pocket before I can try and shoot it down because otherwise it's just gonna be a well, we can't do that because look how much money it makes us. Yeah. But if everyone came to the gala, every donor got the chance to come to the gala, mm -hmm. you might actually make more money because the people that can give 10,000 plus will still give 10,000 plus. And the people that can only do $200 may actually bid on auction items or bring more people. Exactly. So any other things we want to mention in? This is this Sudesh point? again. Um, I sit on a donor recognition committee for another nonprofit. And what we have told our donors is that 
even if you give one dollar, your name is going to be somewhere in the building. Um, so we're trying to make it as equitable as possible. And even um, we're trying to create this beautiful wall piece, um, which there's a lot of big donors out there. There's people have given what is significant to them and they've like really stretched themselves to give money. And so we feel like everybody should be recognized um, on that wall. So uh, that's something that we're working on. But I think even the recognition that donors get needs to be more, I mean, it's it's very skewed right now, uh, so it needs to be a little more, not like oh if you give ten thousand dollars you're going to be recognized like this, and if you give five dollars a different way. So just make it more equitable. Yeah, often in our playbills we list people by how much money they gave, what groups, of, what tier of money they gave, which could be really embarrassing, really embarrassing, and make you not feel appreciated because you couldn't give in the in the higher tiers. So what if we just listed all of our donors without tiering them, without saying these people gave 10,000, these people gave 200. That's great. You might. Yeah, Barbara, I saw your hand pop up too. Yeah, hi. Um, I am not sure if, I. my vision's bad, so I can't even read the little sticky notes. So I, I, but this has prompted me to ask another question that's local. Um, I've really appreciated some of the ideas that have come up over the course of, of our meetings over this last year. And I love the radical, you know, radical idea of re just restructuring the way we approach things. Um, my question is about, um, we have uh, a an opportunity for cultural access um, that was on the ballot and was, um, was turned down by the voters in my portion of South of King County, which is South King County, which is the the most diverse area of of, of King County. And although the East Side is coming right along, and um, and uh, but you know all of the indicators are our lowest socioeconomic status and so on. And I'm among those. Um, so the cultural access is there'll be all this, so much more money. It'll be a boon if we get it, but it's sales tax. And that's, that's I'm really struggling with that. And I, I think that's an equity question. And I, I adore the, the people who are working so hard to make access better for all. But it's sales tax, and it's going to be tough for for our people in South King County. And so, I really think that's an equity question. Um, but I don't. I just don't know how to talk about that. So you're saying there's a new thing on the ballot that's adding a sales tax to fund more art. It's it's culture. Uh, not okay. just arts, but culture, which I, I'm all about culture, not just arts. Um, and uh, it was on the ballot once before and um, was turned, uh, was voted down narrowly. And the votes that came from South King County were thumbs down. Um, so they're going to, uh, organizers are going to try to put it on the ballot again um, in another year or two. And of course, things are so up in the air with all you know everything that's happening in our world right now yeah. um and so as a cultural advocate um i'm just so torn i i want my my people in south king county to have every opportunity at access um but i know that they're you know, the ask is on them. We're in a, a tax, a you know, regressive tax state, the way the way our taxes operate. So how do we have that conversation? And really, I, South King County has never had its voice heard on that, except by turning down this opportunity. Yeah, I'd have to know more about what's in the legend, in the bill, the draft of that bill. And then I think the question really is, who is paying the tax and then who is benefiting from the money generated from the tax. So I couldn't, I couldn't make just by hearing that, I couldn't make a, a thought about the, the inequities of it. Uh, and it also depends on how much the tax is. If it's 
it's, you know, a few cents on a dollar, it may not really affect anyone. So th- feel free to send me the draft language and then I can, you and I can sort of go back and forth on email about it. Um, but thank you for bringing that up. Um, here's some ideas programming everyone that people um, mentioned. Um, and then there's one more thing with audiences. Um, and we often forget about our audiences. They are key to the success of our equity goals. And sometimes we do all the work operations, we do some work on the governance side, we do work programming. And then the audiences who are our ticket buyers and our donors are pushing us to go back to what it was before. So don't forget, they need some training too. So in your regular correspondence, you might want to like think about putting you know, anecdotes about what other arts organizations are doing or training about racial equity. Um, I put in here, have your patrons click on a community anti-racist agreement at the point of purchase. They do it for ticketing policy. So why not say, hey, our culture is we're an anti-racist organization. So we need you to agree to these audience agreements before you come in the space. Um, any thoughts or questions about audiences or programming? All right, so the next thing we want to do, and this was supposed to be on the first slide, I apologize. We'll move those over to the first slide. Um, so ignore the stuff over here. So what we're gonna do now is we wanna take one of our action steps and we wanna start building them into smart outcome goals. So we're gonna actually workshop one thing real quick. Um, so um, Sadisha Ravanya, if you can move these, these uh, Sticky note to the first slide for me, that would be great. Let's look at, thank you. Let's look at diversifying, I can't spell by the way. Diversifying the board. So the SMART outcome says, remember what SMART stands for? Specific, measurable, um, attainable, maybe aggressive relevant and time-based. So is this specific? It's somewhat specific. Is there a measurable in this? Not necessarily. Anyone want to suggest a measurable? Getting them to actually answer the survey questions because everybody on our board kind of refuses to identify when it's like, I've been at the meetings, like, yo, white. I'm not sure I followed that. Basically, force them to actually answer so we have a baseline that we can work off of. Oh, in the, in that, you, when you're doing the interview question. Uh, or basically, uh, not even just like an in intake in, uh, in just getting. Just like, demographics of a board as it exists oh i see so you, they, they're not willing to answer the demographics of who they are yeah i see yeah well that's uh that's someone who is that's an obstacle to your anti-racist plan right if someone's not willing to share that's because they're not interested in seeing diversity happening um so that's a different kind of a thing um so let's say so diversifying the board let's oh no don't take that one away that's the one we're going to, thank, thank you. All right, so that's the one we're going to workshop. So what's a measurable we can put onto this? What if we say we want 50% of our board to be people of color? That's a measurable, right? That's something you can actually count. All right, that makes sense how we get from, so we're, we're somewhat specific, we are measurable, it's attainable, especially in the Pacific Northwest, because you are not hurting for people of color out there. Is it aggressive? Some people may think it is, maybe. Um, is it relevant? Yes, to what we're talking about. And so the last thing to think about is like when and how long. So we can say by year, in three years, So we're going to diversify our board, we're going to 50% of our board in three years. 
that gives us time, uh, measurable, and something specific. Then we have to sort of filter this through the other steps. So the, so the next step was we want to make sure we center BIPOC people. So if we just do this, it doesn't necessarily center BIPOC people. So you want to take, take this language and say something like, why can't I do this right? Is there a second thing on top of it? Ah, that's what it is. Okay. So we want to say, so why, so friends, why are we diversifying our board? What is the reason for it? We want it to represent the population that we're serving. Why? Because well, we want to represent the population, right? So, so I see what you're saying. So you're saying that um, to, um, let's say, so I'm going to make this up, celebrate the, the diversity of our community, 50% of our board, will be BIPOC in three years. Yeah. So now we're really celebrating, we're really centering BIPOC people. Yep. Does that make sense? And does this feel like we are also, now we also want to see, make sure we are, we are embedding this into the culture. So to celebrate the diversity, maybe not, maybe doesn't embed into the culture. We also want to say something like, um, to uh, ensure the value of BIPOC voices are integrated into our governance practices and to celebrate the diversity of our communities, uh, 50% of our board will be BIPOC. That way everyone knows this is about a change of culture. We really want BIPOC voices. It's gonna help us figure out how to govern our organization, which may filter down into how we operate, which may filter down to how we program, which may filter down to how we market and outreach and build relationships with people of color. This, this is how you take a problem, turn it into an action step, and then center BIPOC people and make sure it is embedded into the culture. Does this make sense to everyone? Is there another one we want to look at? And then we'll just spend the last bit of time answering questions. Okay. Any one of the other action steps from the previous pages? We talked about the tiered benefit level. We want to do that one? Sure. Okay. All right. So yeah. the problem is, so if we state the problem, it is that the tiering of benefits marginalize some people and gives benefits, gives more privilege to people that have privilege, right? So that's the problem. We would put that on a board. The solution is to flatline the tiered benefits. Uh, donor benefits, right? So now let's talk about how do we put this into a measurable. So, so it's specific, right? Um, it's measurable because when you have that one flat line, you've done the action. You, when you get it done, it's completed. Um, is it aggressive and attainable? I would say yes. Is it relevant? Yes. And then what kind of time will we want to put on this? 
we say in one year. That way you have time to talk about it, to vet it with current donors, look at it. So now we gotta make sure we're centering BIPOC people. Yeah, that's one that doesn't really take, it doesn't take a year, but it's the red tape that you'll have to do, that you have to cut through. And that's why I think it would take that long too. It's not, yeah, it's not so much even the red tape. It's really like the anxiety of people that are like, you're not gonna get, we're giving at different levels. It won't, it won't affect them. Uh, and most donors don't even use the benefits you give them. That's right? true. So to center BIPOC voices, we could say to value the gifts of our BIPOC donors, whatever you want. I'm just making this language up. Change to one benefit level, one level of donor benefits, something like that by year one. And that gets to a cultural shift as well. Does this make sense, everyone? It's so important to state the problem, list the actions that can eradicate or pioneer. We have some ideas on the page that are pioneering, like um, community agreements at the point of purchase, giving EDI committee veto power. Uh, I've seen organizations do a racism incident report. We have an accident report if someone gets hurt, but why shouldn't we have an incident report? So we can track the number of racist incidents that happen so we can start eradicating them and build a repair process. But this is how you take, you go from, um, and I'll go back to that slide in a second, um, go back from the stating the problem, building an action, and then putting a smart outcome goal on it and making sure BIPOC people are centered into every single action step. This is a racial equity plan. So even like the things like um, educating the, the board and staff, it has to be to reduce harm to BIPOC people, to understand more about the issues BIPOC people have. You really want to make sure your your smart outcome goals are are stating the need and bypass people. Huh. So we have a note from Will here. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I this is clunky the version I've done, but you can make it better. I was going to put his on the Jamboard. Do you want to put it on there? Yeah, you can. Yeah. What I put was clunky. All right, so um, let's go back to the slide and review the, um, the steps again. So you really have it clear and then I'll show you again the last uh, slide about the framework. Um, so hopefully I've made that kind of clear, you all. Um, here's that slide we were looking at earlier. So you want to state the specific problems. A lot of people have a hard time really identifying actions. Actions are things that you're actually going to do. So it might be easier for them to just state the problem, list all the problems on the board. And then secondly, create creatively ideate actions that will dismantle or eradicate the problems. So if you say something like HR, we're not getting the response. The problem is we're not getting the response from people of color. So the actions are, let's relook at our HR practices. Let's look at the, the job descriptions. Let's look at how it's being posted. Let's look at the interview process. Let's look at the onboarding process, uh, all those things. And then put them into smart outcome goals. Make sure you're centering BIPOC needs and make sure each action attempts to change the culture. That's the most important thing in my mind. You really wanna to get to an anti-racist culture. And then we wanna formulate this into a, a, um, a plan. Let's review that plan again. Uh, so again, this was designed by of, by, for all. It's a simple thing. So after you get all your actions, you're gonna have about 30 or 40 of them. You would plug them into this document. What are things we're gonna do that are external and immediate external and long-term, internal, immediate, internal, long-term. So some of the external things would be 
the um, training your patrons in how to be anti-racist. An immediate thing for um, that's an external thing would be having patrons um, sign an agreement at the point of purchase. Um, the governance thing, the longer term thing is 50% of our board of people of color in year three. An immediate thing would be change the job description of board meeting, board uh, of the change the job description of boards to include advancing racial equity and their evaluation. Yeah. All right. We got 10 minutes for questions, right? Eight minutes for questions, then we have to close out. What questions might you all have? I can start again. Um, so when you're doing the racial equity plan, who should be involved in it? I would encourage you all to have, well, one, it, the training could be the whole company. Um, and, and actually what we've done is we've built a training onboarding packet. So at, at the job that I run, I run the state arts agency. Um, one, we've changed our job descriptions to highlight our racial equity goals at the very beginning. We got rid of anything that might deter people of color from applying. The interview process asks people to tell us what you've done to advance racial equity in your life or at your last job so that no one is entering the company that hasn't started doing racial equity work. And then when they get there, they get an onboarding packet which, with three hours of clips and learnings about racial equity. So they come into the organization on the same page, which is really good. So that's one thing. But your question to your question, I think what I would encourage you all to do is create a committee of people that are made up of board, staff, artists, and maybe even some audience members that are connected to you in a way to build this. But you can start the process with the full staff and board, I always suggest, the, especially stating the problem and the ideating of action steps. And then the committee can start working them into smart outcome goals and building a framework. Once you have a plan, if you aren't a very diverse organization, I would get, get together a group of BIPOC people to look at the plan and give you feedback and then make some edits. And then once that is done, I would publish it. Put it on your website, put it in your email, send it to every patron, and then update it quarterly. And so if you have all these measurables, you can create some kind of tracking sheet to say what we've done. And then when you go to your quarterly board meetings, you can update the board on where you are and maybe even send it out in your email to all your patrons. Here's what we said we were gonna do. Here's what we've achieved this quarter. That way you're getting full transparency and engagement. Right, do we have uh, one more question? Maybe time for one more question. Thoughts or comments? Okay, so. I have, found, I have found organizations, when they break it down like this, it's easier for them to write a plan. And if anyone needs some help, feel free to reach out to me. You have my information. Um, Sabisha will send it out in the recap of this. So um, I, hope I, I hope this has helped you. Thanks.
Thank you, Michael. Um, thank you for sharing your time, your knowledge, um, you know, and all the information that you have here with East Up and in the Pacific Northwest community. Um, I want to thank everyone for um, attending and for your interest and support of East Hub throughout this year. Um, your input is very valuable to us and we hope to continue to engage with you as the East Side continues to become a more inclusive and vibrant cultural destination. Please share your final email with others that Sedition will send so that um, they can view the entire series. So um, I just want to say a couple of things uh, for me. I personally enjoyed uh, helping to create and host this series, as well as learning more about how I can help to um, create a more equitable world. Uh, thank you so much. I've enjoyed working with Michael and Ray and Sadishna. And thank you to our founder, um, Ray, for introducing this new idea that we kicked off this February for Black History Month. So I hope that this series will inform us for many seasons. And Sadishana, I'm gonna pass it on to you to wrap up. Perfect.